hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday, the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded along all the fronts. The German war is therefore at an end. The end of the war meant the end of the coalition government. An election was called. The Conservative Party's manifesto offered some social benefits, but stressed the need to guard against the totalitarian menace which they saw in their opponents' plans. The Labour Party declared their intention to plan for full employment and to build up the welfare state. The election was held on July the 5th. The newsreel seemed less than happy with the results. Labour will now have a majority over all parties in a house of 640. It was sensational. Three weeks ago or more, when you recorded your votes, very few of you would have prophesied a working majority for Labour, much less one of about 200 seats. Newspapers carried the astonishing news to an amazed public. For, let's face it, whoever imagined such a result? And slowly, the model of it all struck home. Labour landslide. It was tremendously euphoric in my village, which was a mining village. We thought we were going into a new life and not back to an old life. And it was a great feeling that we were going to make a new society that was different from anything that had gone before for our parents or indeed their parents. So it was very, very exciting at that time. Neil Milligan was a railway worker, strongly committed to the nationalisation of the railways. During the war, the railways had been controlled by the government. This produced many advantages, but it was unclear what would happen afterwards. Well, it was a great relief to know that the industry would be nationalised, that we wouldn't go back to the private owners with all the doubts and fears that existed uh, had it gone back to them, because by that time it was clearly established that the four basic railway companies couldn't have continued uh, as independent groupings, or indeed maybe not at all, had it not been for the war years and finally the takeover on nationalisation. Nationalisation was part of the overall economic plan of the government, and not just a rescue operation forced on it by the state of the railway companies. All transport was to be taken over and developed. It was of major national importance. Since the 20s, public transport was well within the reach of the working class, and more people were travelling now than ever before. Reconstruction and social change would further increase the need for efficient transport. But the Labour Party had much more in mind besides nationalising transport. Their programme was formidable, and within a few years, the immediate aims were achieved. Transport was in public ownership, and this required the takeover of three separate and quite dissimilar industries. But the complete programme of nationalisation added up to a quarter of all British industry. State ownership was never seen as an end in itself, but as the basis for social reform. The first step in this direction was made with the foundation of the welfare state, a system of social security which transformed the prospects of most working people. During the same few years, the welfare revolution was advanced by the introduction of the National Health Service, which provided free health care for everyone. The children born in the war were the first beneficiaries of the welfare state, and the ones to gain most from these changes. But the Attlee government was not able to concentrate solely on these developments. From the very beginning, it faced desperate financial problems. America withdrew the wartime credit arrangements, only two days after the election results were announced. Over the following two years, the balance of trade worsened and there was a sterling crisis. Wartime import restrictions couldn't be relaxed and shortages got worse. Many common necessities were still rationed, including bread. People were hungry and cold, 
In response to coal shortages, some steam engines were converted to oil. Despite all these handicaps, the government pressed ahead with its nationalisation plans. Nationalising the railways was not a new idea. As long ago as 1844, Gladstone introduced an act enabling the government to acquire them, but this was never taken up. Railway unions had always been in the forefront of the struggle for nationalisation. They began campaigning in the 1890s, and the fight steadily gained momentum. Arguments flourished, books and pamphlets were written on the subject. The support for nationalisation crossed conventional political barriers. Even Winston Churchill was in favour of state ownership. Railways in private hands must be used for immediate direct profit, but it might pay the state to run the railways at a loss to develop industries and agriculture. Chief activist on the issue of nationalisation was Herbert Morrison, who backed vision with practical measures such as the Highway Code. Will you help to promote safety and goodwill on the road? That is the meaning of this picture which appeals to you on behalf of National Safety Week. As Transport Minister in the 1929 Labour government, he reorganised London's transport under public ownership and pushed through other radical measures to improve transport. That is the purpose of the new official highway code which has just been published. Morrison's policy was outlined in his book, Socialisation and Transport. Transport must be brought together and its problems dealt with as a whole. That will enable us to destroy the biased railway mind and the biased road mind and substitute a big transport mind. In 1945, a detailed plan for state ownership was urgently needed. There was in the Ministry of Transport, uh, gathering dust on the shelves, uh, a report which, and this is rather surprising, had been prepared uh, in accordance with instructions given by Sir John Reith when he was Minister of Transport in 1940. Actually, it was at the time of the Battle of Britain and the Dunkirk evacuation. <laughs> That's beside the point. And this had proposed a nationalised transport authority and public boards uh, for all the forms of transport, but not much was done about it. In fact, it was laid aside. In 1945, with a sudden requirement to prepare a bill for nationalising transport. The dust was blown off this report, but it didn't go very far, and the civil servants had to get to work straight away to devise uh, the form of a bill which would, would, in fact, carry out these election pledges. It was an immense task. Not only had all forms of transport to be taken over and placed under state control, legal documents drawn up and compensation paid, but also the proposals attracted ferocious opposition. The Conservative Party predictably opposed the bill. The railway companies oscillated between attacking the plan and pretending it didn't exist. The head in the sand attitude was most clearly demonstrated by one of the railway companies, which continued to make expensive public relations films while the bill was going through Parliament. The films stressed the superiority of rail over road. We can now understand a part of the impossibility of moving such a volume of material by any other means than a railway system. In a very short time, the roads would be hopelessly choked, even if there were enough lorries in the first place. Another aim was to show the merits of the individual company which was about to go. The workers are away, away on their annual holiday, their wakes week when they leave their looms, leave the murky cotton town, and go in search of fun and relaxation. What a week, what a time. And what a time it must have been when there was no railway to make such a welcome change possible. Happy as one large family, they all pack into the trains in which, despite the crowds, there is the minimum of discomfort. That this is so is due to the foresight and efficiency of the LMS. A tremendous amount of work is done by railwaymen to see that the trains and their holiday-bound loads get off safely and punctually. Any idea where they're all going? Well, I shouldn't be surprised if it's Blackpool. Arguments about the state ownership of railways were of an altogether different tone than those about road haulage. It was the nationalisation of this section of transport which provoked the fiercest opposition. <laughs> 
the road hauliers connived with the Conservative Central Office in an effort to sabotage the bill. Macmillan, Eden and Thornycroft led the attack in the Commons and pledged to undo the legislation even before the Act was passed. Road hauliers united to oppose the bill, hiring the champions of free enterprise, the aims of industry group, to handle their publicity. Their opposition failed. Two years after Labour's victory, the bill became law. In 1947, by Act of Parliament, Britain set up the British Transport Commission. Its task, through its executives, to make all transport work as one. To operate a nation's railways, 120 reduced to four and now reduced to one to coordinate the transport that runs on 200,000 miles of roads, to operate the docks and revive a nation's waterways, extensive but long neglected. And the buses and lorries, what have we taken on there? Well, even here there were the beginnings of amalgamation, but compared with the railways, they were a young industry. So you had big combines and a mass of small operators. That's why the job of taking them over bristles with problems for all concerned. The Transport Commission, the men who run them, and the men who drive them. And the railways, what have we got there? Operated for more than a hundred years without a break. Feed in a war machine for six weary years without adequate renewals and repairs that left them as tired as the rest of us. A wonderful but complicated heritage that could do with a bit of sorting out. They've taken over the whole shoot, the nice bits and the awkward bits. The takeover involved a whole new management structure. The Minister of Transport retained overall responsibility, but a new policy-making body was created. The British Transport Commission was effectively owner and director of the state-owned undertaking. The Commission was in charge of long-term planning and had to coordinate the development of different aspects of transport in the public interest. Under it, there were five managements called executives. Road transport, docks and inland waterways, railway hotels, London transport, and railways. The railways were by far the biggest undertaking. What did all this mean for the passengers? At first, there wasn't a great deal to show. Services continued to run very much as before but some new provisions were included to safeguard passengers' interests. In theory, at least, the customer of the old private companies could take their business elsewhere if the service they received is unsatisfactory, although in practice there was usually no alternative. To guard against the new nationalised body abusing its monopoly, the 47 Act established transport users' consultative committees to represent the voice of the traveller. Customers could complain to their local committee about any aspect of the transport system. In practice, almost all the complaints concerned the railways, because they were the largest part of the operation. Would nationalisation benefit the industry's workforce? It was certainly intended to. Though wages and conditions improved, there was no significant move towards workers' control. Trade unions were largely excluded from management. Women found that union and management alike were determined to keep them in what they thought was their place, service work, with little or no hope of promotion, and certainly no place in the boardroom. Public school education and university degrees were still the way into management. Experience in the industry counted for little. The selection of top management was still based on those at the top, who had been in the top under private enterprise, selecting the people who would continue. There were one or two trade union officials moved into the Transport Commission as personnel managers and that sort of thing. But I think that they basically became prisoners of the system and accepted it as it was. And there was no fundamental change in se selection of management. <laughs> 
nationalization in itself had been an aim for trade unionists. It had been widely assumed that the structure of a nationalized industry would be different from the hierarchy of the old companies. But in practice, there were too many similarities. If the act disappointed some of the most committed supporters of nationalization, it was also criticized on structural grounds. The relationship between ministry, commission and executive was unsatisfactory. One of the defects was that while the commission set out policy objectives, it didn't have the power to select the head of the executives who would see the policies through. All the top jobs were controlled by the ministry. The Minister of Transport not only appointed the chairman of the commission, he also appointed the chairman of the individual executives, even though they were accountable to the commission. The arrangement generally proved a recipe for conflict, but this was most extreme in the relationship between the commission and the railway executive. The first chairman of the commission, Sir Cyril Herkham, took on the job at the age of 64, after a distinguished career in the Ministry of Transport. The chairman of the railway executive, Sir Eustace Missenden, had been the general manager of the Southern Railway before nationalisation. The growing hostility between the two men was obvious to those who worked near them. The two men were so different. Herkham was a very, very experienced civil servant. Uh, he knew Whitehall and Westminster inside out. Missenden was a practical general manager, very competent in his own way, but he didn't really care for politicians at all. And he didn't like civil servants either. <laughs> Consequently, uh, he approached them with suspicion. Such disagreements and personality clashes impeded decisions on major issues. One of these was integration, the plan to link together the different forms of transport so that they would complement each other. Despite disagreements, a start was made. For instance, British Road Services lorries offered a door-to-door -door service, but transferred the goods to the rail for the major part of the journey. This minimised heavy road traffic and ensured that the railway services were used to capacity. It was a long-term aim to integrate passenger services as well. But the British Transport Commission did not control all the buses. Some were run by local authorities and some were privately owned. The Commission's first step was to negotiate compatible timetables. But integration and development of any kind needed more than the agreement of the various executives. They needed cash. One development that did get through was the electrification of the main line railway between Manchester and Sheffield. Steam trains were replaced by electric trains, and an entirely new tunnel was built under the Pennines, alongside the old one. But this was not a new plan. It had been considered prior to nationalisation. Another project that had been around before the takeover was the double-decker train. At London's Charing Cross, Britain's first double-decker train is sent on its way by Mr. Morrison and given an approving once-over by its drivers of tomorrow. For its maiden journey, this all-British-built train has distinguished company, Transport Minister Alfred Barnes and the Lord President, himself a frequent traveller on this Dartford line. Finding a means to carry the increasing number of passengers meant looking for new solutions. Lengthening platforms to take longer trains was one idea, and the double-decker train was a short-lived experiment. Very few new projects were launched because the finance was not made available. The Act stipulated, if somewhat vaguely, that transport was to pay its way. The railways were not really required to produce any specific net receipts. They were expected to do the best they could because the various executives were not, so to speak, allocated chunks of capital until they had to earn the interest on that capital. They, the commission as a whole had to cover the interest, and some executives, it was quite clear, uh, would n never probably make a profit. Others would do fairly well. It was simply a question of the commission as a whole getting enough money out of the executives to pay the interest charges and meet its own central costs. The interest charges were a result of the settlement agreed between the government and the old railway company owners. 
The system of compensation was fairly simple so far as the railways were concerned. They took an average of the three years uh, before nationalization and the stock exchange valuation that had emerged from those particular uh, net revenues and dividends that were paid then was used as the basis for compensation. So far as road haulage was concerned, that was much more complicated. Every business had to be examined, the books studied, and a price negotiated, uh, including a payment for goodwill and so forth, plus the value of the vehicles and the garages and the associated equipment and so on. So that was a very long process, and it went on for some three years after nationalization. I think the terms of compensation for the railway industry disillusioned us immediately. The railways had been nationalized too early. If we had waited a couple of years, two of them, two of the railway companies would already have the people in to wind them up because in fact they were bankrupt. That's indicative that the industry was in serious financial difficulties, serious operating difficulties in the year that compensation was agreed. And of course that denuded the railway of capital. It denuded it of modernization potential. We were a very, very poor railway industry compared to many other countries in Europe. And we were saddled with this great compensation button that lasted 20 years. The railways were made to pay dearly for a system which was outdated. They inherited a fine tradition of steam engineering and continued to push this technology to its limits. But steam would have to be replaced. Modernization on a grand scale would be needed if the railways were to play a central role in the development of the country. In 1951, the British Transport Commission had been operating for only four years. To put transport on a sound footing, it would need both money and time. Up till then, it had not had the money, and time, as it transpired, had run out. It was no surprise to those with the course of the 1950 election in mind when Conservatives began to overhaul Socialists on this second day. And, of course, radios were active everywhere. They told a tale of slow but steady conservative improvement. At Woodford, the mayor, as returning officer, gave the name of the victorious candidate, a very famous name. Honourable Winston Spencer Churchill. <laughs> Labour Party headquarters, conceding a narrow victory to the Tories, greeted Mr Attlee with respectful dignity. In a strenuous campaign, he hadn't spared himself. But, for the time being, it was the end of socialist government. With the return of the Conservatives to power, priorities changed. In transport, there was a complete reversal of the policy of the previous government. The profitable road haulage industry was sold off to private enterprise. This removed at a stroke all hopes of an integrated network and set the different kinds of transport in competition against each other. Mm -hmm. 